Like in that Annie Dillard book, where she sees that eagle with the skull of a weasel hanging from its neck. Here's how it happened. Listen. Eagle bites the weasel. Weasel bites back. They fly up to nowhere. Weasel keeps hanging on together forever. We were going nowhere, just driving around. You did all the talking, and me, I didn't make a sound. And if I open my mouth now, I'll fall to the ground. And if I open my mouth now, there's so much I'd say. Like I can never be honest. Like I'm in it for the thrill. Like I never loved anyone, and I never will. Okay, I'm Alan Lugner Waitkus, and I'm going to do my best here to explain Annie Dillard's Living Like Weasels. This is probably the toughest piece for me to teach. Uh, not so much because it's a difficult piece, but because it's, uh, I don't want to screw it up. I really like it and I find students find it hard to understand and uh, struggle with it. And so, uh, you know, this had a huge impact on me and that's why I teach it. I also teach it for descriptive reasons and for, uh, for you to kind of see how to write a narrative essay. Um, and, you know, using some of the, the things that uh, Dillard does uh, in this essay. So as we're going through this, there'll be some pictures of Annie Dillard from around the time she wrote it to currently and from um, and various other images uh, and those kinds of things, what's going on while I'm talking about this. The, I started with Laurie Anderson and a, um, a song. Laurie Anderson is a performance artist. Uh, and the song that she recorded uh, that was, um, of course, alludes to this piece. And uh, we'll look at another thing by Laurie Anderson later because the, the two, you know, Dillard is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer, um, generally nonfiction, creative nonfiction, whereas Laurie Anderson is a, you know, performance artist. She was married to Lou Reed, blah, 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 blah. But I see a lot of connections between the two, and I'm going to uh, make some of those a, a little while. Uh, later. Now, again, we open up in, in literature, we refer to it as exposition, right? In an essay, we would refer to it as your introduction, uh, which is giving you that basic information. That's why students kind of get lost here a little bit. Uh, Annie Dillard says, um, you know, she gives you this background about a weasel. You know, it's wild. Who knows what it thinks? And the, the point is there, it doesn't. Um, you know, it, what is it thinking about? Uh, instinct, right? Biting prey. Uh, and notice the, the, the words here. We're going to talk about uh, dominant impressions and, and word choice. And again, she, she uses very violent words, right? Because this essay uh, is intended to use those. So, you know, it, it bites its prey at the neck, either splitting the jugular vein at the throat or crunching the brain at the base of the skull, right? Very, um, very descriptive language. And she moves on, you know, talking about this naturalist who has to get it off. You know, the weasel just won't let go, right? It, it grabs on to its necessity uh, and, and won't let go. Uh, then she moves into the uh, story that Dillard uh, references in, in the song we started with. And that is this, this uh, idea of the, the weasel. Now, Anderson's take on it is a little different. She's kind of uh, playing with it to fit her, her song and the subject matter there. But, again, this uh, Ernest uh, Thompson Seton sees a, a weasel, um, a dead eagle with a skull. He shoots the eagle, right? And there's a weasel stuck uh, to its neck, right? The supposition being... Um, you know, the, the weasel bit on and his instinct told him it wouldn't let go. Now, uh, 
you know, did, uh, I would like to have seen that eagle, she writes, uh, from the air a few weeks or months before he was shot. Was the whole weasel still attached a fe- uh, to his feathered throat, a fur pendant, or did the eagle eat what he could reach, gutting the living uh, weasel with its talons before its breast, bending its beak, bleeding, uh, uh, cleaning the beautiful airborne bones? And so again, we get this idea here um, that, you know, we don't know how the, the weasel died. We just know it was miserable, right? Now, this, this next area, she, she moves into the second area, and she, or second sort of section, and that's where we really get our thesis, okay? Now, normally our thesis would go in the introduction, which says, I have been reading about weasels because I saw one last week, okay? It was that simple. Why, why is she talking about weasels? Because she saw one last week. Um, and so she goes through, you know, this sort of background, um, about Holland's Pond, and uh, Mur- uh, which is also called Murray's Pond, uh, near Tinker Creek, um, and she, uh, you know, gives us this description, right? And that's this great descriptive words here. I love this idea of the brown and white steers standing in the middle of it, merely dampening their hooves. From the distant shore, they look like miracle itself, complete with miracles and nonchalance. Now, what does she mean by that? She means like it looks like they're walking on water, right? If you can't see the bottom of water, this is why, you know, rednecks always end up being washed away because they think they can drive their vehicle across a, uh, you know, creek or stuff. Because when it's moving or when it's... um, stagnant but dark or covered in lily pads you can't you don't know if it's six inches deep or ten feet deep and um so again them they they look like they're walking on water this is kind of a religious you know clearly reference to jesus walking on water that miracle um and so we get that idea that she gets some sort of spirituality um through this uh without directly you know saying that um now she uses a whole lot of you know, these descriptive words and these, these sort of opposites, right? Uh, juxtaposition is what we'd call them. Uh, with man and animal, setting up them, them kind of meeting, right? We've got a, 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 a highway, which would represent man at one end of the pond, wood ducks at the other, uh, beer cans, muskrat hops. Um, you know, all of these different uh, juxtaposing things between human beings and, and animals. And one of the biggest questions we get is this so, right? Uh, with a period. A lot of people think that that's an error, that, you know, she's got some sort of fragment in here. What she's using that uh, is, is a, it's an effective technique. And you have to remember, authors can be funny. Um, again, you probably don't think this is funny, but what she does is she sort of establishes it. She uses it twice. So the first time she does it, she establishes it as, I kind of got off point here, right? So she says so. It's kind of like my way of saying, anyway, let's get back to what we were discussing. Um, and so it's sort of, I digress, right? And so she says, so, let me get back to what I'm talking about here. I'd crossed the highway, stepped over the low bar bar fence, and, you know, she gets into how she'd gotten there. She's setting up this, this, this weasel idea. Um, now, she, she talks about the interaction of, of the weasel. Um, let's see. One of the things, where, um, did I miss it? Um, where she says the, it was a little earlier on, I apologize. She says the, the water lilies have blossomed and spread to a horizontal plane that is terra firma to pl- plotting, uh, blackbirds and tremulous ceiling to black leeches, crayfish, and carp. Again, she's, this is a great juxtap- uh, juxtaposition here. She's setting up this idea that from above, it looks like terra firma, which means solid ground, right? To the birds. But below, it's like shaky ceiling to the fish and other things under the, the water. And so, again, we have this, um, this idea of these two opposing things. One thing sort of offering, you know, uh, having two different appearances. Again, this, this, this juxtaposition. Now, one of the things that I, I really like here, and again, goes back to the importance when you're writing your essay and this, this point of a, a dominant impression, is th- there's one sentence in here. She basically, all she's saying is... Um, Pretty much, she, it turns around, okay, (laughs) while she's seated. But she says, I was stunned into stillness twisted backward on the tree trunk, okay? Uh, Again, great choice of words there, right? She was stunned, stunned into stillness twisted backward on the tree trunk. Again, she's using very violent words um, to describe something as simple as turning around, stunned, twisted, backward. Right? But then she also uses calming words at the same time, like stillness, okay? Uh, so she's, she's really uh, juggling some complex things there. Um, now, <laughs> this is a great paragraph. 
uh, when she says, Our eyes locked as if two lovers or deadly enemies met unexpectedly on an overgrown path when each had been thinking of something else. A clearing uh, blow to the gut. Okay, now, again, think about this. You're in the middle of nowhere, um, and all of a sudden you run into, again, these, these juxtaposing ideas, opposites, two, deadly, two lovers or deadly enemies. Um, and you're, So you're in the middle of nowhere, and you see your mortal enemy, right? Uh, someone you've sworn to fight to the death, uh, or a long-lost lover. Um, the, the initial reaction is the same, right? There's that instinct. It's a clearing blow to the gut, she says. Um, and so it's interesting how those two opposites create the same reaction. It was also a bright, to the, uh, 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 a bright blow to the brain or a sudden beating of brains with all the charge and intimate grate of rubbed balloons. It emptied our lungs. Again, we'd call this hyperbole. She's exaggerating here. It felled the forest, moved the fields, and drained the pond. The world dismantled and tumbled into that black hole of eyes. Now, this is the line that a lot of people get really confused with. If you and I um, uh, looked at each other that way, our skulls would split and drop to our shoulders. But we don't. We keep our skulls. So, now, again, she, she's making a reference here. A lot of people have a hard time understanding this. It, it's that idea you see in cartoons where something shocking happens and a character's tongue rolls down or their head explodes. or that, That's what she kind of means here. If we could see into each other's brains, like she saw into this weasel's brain, um, you know, into each, each other's brains, our, our skulls would split. We couldn't take it, right? Um, our heads would explode. Okay, but she says we don't. We keep our skulls. And then she says so. Now, again, earlier she established this, right, as kind of her way of saying I digress. And so what's funny here is she says, um, she uses it again. But here, as a reader, we're kind of shocked by this line. It's very, very violent and very, very graphic. And, and earlier she wasn't mean. And so she's kind of like, so. Um, and so it would be sort of, as I said, something, you know, really, really shocking. I have an example I'll use in class, uh, but I'm not going to use it in here because... Uh, it's on, it'll be on YouTube, and um, but you know, I, uh, me saying something really shocking, and then saying so anyway. Back to what I was saying, uh, and you know, it generally gets a little bit of a laugh uh, um, because that, then they kind of understand it. Um, now, um, what does she see in his mind? Nothing. Okay, uh, she makes that point because there's nothing. Now, what goes on in his mind the rest of this uh, time? What does the weasel think about? He won't say. Okay, again, um, that's a great, great line. It's funny, right? Because he can't say it. Um, but I love this, and you can see that Dillard's also a poet here, and, and her, her, her choice, uh, her diction here is brilliant. His journal is tracks in clay, a spray of feathers, mouse blood and bone, uncollected, unconnected, loose leaf and blown. Okay, now, what Dillard generally does in her writings is, is discuss... Um, nature and a lot, mostly the violence of nature, and then she moves into sort of relating that to the human condition, and that's where we make this jump. Um, she says, "I would like to learn or remember how to live." Okay, that's a, that's a great idea there because she she wants to, you know, she's basically saying we don't live anymore, right? Um, now she says, "Learn to live or or remember." Now, what she means by that is, again, think about when you were a kid, or, or more so toddler and infant, right? You basically um, were, were living. You, you, you just needed your necessities, right? Uh, food, um, to go to the bathroom, to uh, have shelter, right? You didn't worry about all of this crap uh, that we waste our time um, worrying about and, and not living in the moment. Um, what what she, she says, you know, but I might learn something of mindlessness, okay? Again, if, if not, what she means by that is, it, we actually, the term mindfulness is used a lot, which they seem like opposite terms, um, but there's this idea that trying to get back that, the purity of living in the physical sense and the dignity of living without bias or motive, okay? So what do they mean by that? Um, she says, the weasel lives in necessity and we live in choice, hating necessity and dying at the last ignobly in its talons. Um, I would like to live as I should, as the weasel lives as he should, and I suspect for me the way is like the weasels, open to time and death painlessly, noticing everything, remembering nothing, Choosing the given with a fierce and pointed will. I think here Dillard really gets to what this essay is all about. And that is, we don't, and this is a very common theme in my American literature class and, and, and a lot of the stuff that I teach, we don't live in 
the present, right? Um, we live in the past. We think, you know, remember Dillard earlier said remembering nothing. She wants to do that. We, we sort of are hung up on our past or we're sort of thinking about the future. And, you know, all we ever see, all the, that we live in is, is the current, is the present. And we don't really notice that. We don't enjoy that. And that's what, I'm going to play another quote here by any, uh, by, sorry, Laurie Anderson uh, that's very similar. It's from her documentary, uh, Heart of a Dog, uh, award-winning documentary that she made. And, and she has this great line about how we live in the gap between um, the moment is arising, right, the future, and the one that is, um, the moment is arising, oh, I can't remember her exact words. We live between the moment that is arising and the one that is expiring, right? And so we live between past and future. Um, and she's got some more words about the real city. She's relating back to something she said earlier. But then she says, you know, when you close your eyes, what do you see? And then she says, nothing, right? So if we're not paying attention, what do we see? Nothing. If we close our eyes, what do we see? Nothing. And so then she sort of says in a commanding way, uh, now open them, right? The point being, open your eyes to what's going on now, okay? And that's exactly what Dillard's saying. So let me play that, that quote, and then we'll go back to um, the essay. To live in the gap between the moment that is expiring and the one that is arising, luminous and empty. The real city falling through your mind in glittering pieces. And when you close your eyes, what do you see? Nothing. Now open them. Okay. Um, Dillard continues with, I missed my chance. I should have gone for the throat. Okay. So she should have grabbed on and, and, and followed it and lived like it lived. She's got some great, again, wording here. Dillard, Faulkner loved to show off with his um, ability to write. And um, Dillard here, I think, does, does the same thing. She says... Um, down is a good place to go where the mind is single. Down is out, out of your ever-loving mind and back to your careless senses. I remember prolongness, I'm sorry, I remember muteness as a prolonged and giddy fast where every moment is a feast of utterance received. Time and events are merely poured and remarked and ingested directly like blood pulsed into my gut through a ju jugular vein. Could two live that way? Uh, could two live under the wild rose and explore by the pond so that the smooth mind of each is everywhere present to the other and is received in a, a, as unchallenged as falling snow? Okay, she asks this question. Um, again, and earlier I, I missed a, a line. She's uh, the great line here. Again, remember she's playing with these opposites. She says, I could very calmly go wild. Uh, right? I, I love that idea, using calmly and wild uh, together. Uh, it, it's, it's, amazing there um so she says so she's asked this question could we can, can we do this right and she said we, we could you know uh, we can live any way we want um people take vows of poverty chastity and obedience even of silence by choice okay um again here she plays with the idea of of, of silence um being the stressed of these three, uh, the, the, the most stressed of the three, right? Poverty, chastity, and obedience, even of silence. And what's interesting about that is in class, I will write poverty, chastity, obedience, silence. Which of these could we go the longest, right? I mean, which are, and because and, and, people were, why, why stress silence? That's the easiest of these. And so I'll say, okay, which could you go longer? Poverty, without money, right? Chastity, without sex. Uh, obedience, without, without freedom. Or silence without talking, and and you know generally silence will not get a single vote, right? You've got the people, students who swear they couldn't go with with money without money, right? Students who couldn't go without sex, students who couldn't go with without freedom. But if you think about it, we, we can do those things a lot longer than we can you know not open our mouths and bitch about it. Um, you know we, those you know sort of monks that take vows of, of silence. We know that monks take vows of, of obedience, poverty, and chastity. Uh, right? That doesn't shock us as much. It's the, the fact that they can't talk. So I think subconsciously we know that's the hardest of these things uh, to do. But she says, you know, we can do those. Uh, another great line here that she moves through, it, it moves into, is she says, you know, um, 
Uh, the thing is to stalk your calling with a skilled and supple way to locate the most tender and live spot and plug into that pulse. This is yielding, not fighting. A weasel doesn't attack anything. A weasel lives as he's meant to, yielding at every moment to the perfect freedom of single necessity. This is a, a think about it this way. Um, and again, this goes into the, the id, Freud's theory of the id, the ego, and the superego, right? The id being, you know, our sort of animal brain that tells us to do whatever we want. The superego being, you know, how we have to live by society standards as, as human beings, right? As civilized human beings. And the ego being sort of that in-between. And Annie Diller's really wanting to push us over here toward that id. And what she's saying is the superego in society, right, tells us that, um, you know, I always will give the example, you're walking to your car and someone you don't know and you've never met um, comes up to you and says something that's um, just completely, you know, the most offensive thing that you could possibly imagine uh, being said to you. You know, what is your reaction what, or what does your body tell you to do versus what do you really do? Most of the times our, our brain says, you know, beat the bejesus out of that person, right? It's sort of like when a cell phone goes off in class. I'd love to just grab it and smash it to the ground. That's what my brain tells me to do. But again, what does society say to do? And what do we do? We don't uh, attack that person generally, right? We, we would sort of may say something rude to them, but we, and so what she's saying is, we don't do that because society says if we beat, beat down that person who said that offensive thing, we're attacking that person. And Dillard's saying, no, no, no. What we're doing here is we're yielding, right? We're yielding to um, instinct. So again, when, we're, when we don't do anything, that's what we're fighting. We're fighting that instinct. Uh, and we could learn a lot about, uh, about living through that. Uh, finally, she says, I think it would be well and proper and obedient and pure to grasp your one necessity and not let it go to dangle it uh, limp wherever it takes you. Then even death, where you're going, no matter how you live, cannot you part, okay? Uh, the idea here being, we're, we're all gonna die, right? Um, no matter how we live, no matter what we do. So she says, seize it up and let it seize you up aloft even till, till your eyes burn out and drop. Again, she's going back to that weasel. Let your musky flesh fall off in shreds and let your very bones unhinge and scatter, loosened over fields, over fields and woods, lightly, thoughtless, from any height at all, from as high as eagles. Now, the point here is, again, we're going to die, no matter what, she's saying. And so she re references back, and she doesn't directly, again, a good author is not going to directly tell us what she means here, but what she's basically saying is, you know, you can live a fun life, or you can live um, a, a very meticulously um, calculated and boring life, worried about your own safety and, and, you know, all of these other things, doing what's right. And she's saying, you know, it's all going to end in death either way. Either way. Now, what happened with this weasel? Because instinct taught it to, to bite that eagle, did it die? Absolutely. Did it die a horrible death? Absolutely. But we're all going to die, right? What did it get to do that no other weasel that we know of has gotten to do? It, it got to fly. And so that's what she's saying there. You know, again, these chances, uh, learning to live in the moment, will end in, in, you know, again, could end in death, it could end badly, but we have to take those chances in order to um, get the benefits from them. If we live too calculated and too carefully, we'll never get to fly. Uh, anyway, so I hope that makes more sense. If you have any questions about it, feel free to call me. Until next time. You know that little clock? The one on your VCR? The one that's always blinking 12 noon? Because you never figured out how to get in there and change it. So it's always the same time. Just the way it came from the factory. Good morning. Good night. Same time tomorrow. We're in record.
So here are the questions. Is time long? Or is it wide? And the answers? Sometimes the answers just come in the mail. And one day you get that letter you've been waiting for forever. And everything it says is true. And then in the last line it says, Burn this. And what I really want to know is this. Are things getting better? Or are they getting worse? Stop, stop. Pause, pause. We're in record. Because history's stories that we have remembered and most of them never even get written down. And so when they say things like, we're going to do this by the book, you have to ask, what book? Because it would make a big difference if it was Dostoevsky, or just, you know, burning buildings in a fiery red sea. I remember all my lovers. I remember how they held me. who came before me were in record. Come here, little girl. Get into the car. It's a brand new Cadillac. Bright red. Come here, little We put him in the ground. When my father died, it was like a whole library had burned down. Stop, stop.
and wild beasts shall rest there. And owls shall answer one another there. And the hairy ones shall dance there. And sirens in the temples of pleasure. Speak my language. Good night. Good night.